discover a classic every Sunday at noon on Cinemax. 100 number, and they began to pay attention, and that really changed the way politics, presidential politics, was practiced. And I think that's with us now for a long time. So you want to see back to the news, see them do more. You'd like to see them change and react and find a new definition of a nightly news show that reflects the fact that there's more news already been told out there. That's right, but I don't know how to do it. If I did know how to do it, I would have suggested it a long time ago. So, but the nightly news programs, as we know, are dinosaurs. Yes, I've used that word in the past. I'll <laughs> tell you that the interesting thing is that most Americans, because they're also impossibly young Americans, they, most Americans do not remember Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, Life and Look. These were enormously powerful instruments of American journalism that brought us fiction, poetry, nonfiction, magazine art, photography, and they all died within about a three or four year period back in the early 1960s. Because of television because of television and because of a changing world. I have to wonder now if Time, Newsweek, U.S. News, and the three evening newscasts may not be facing the same kind of extinction problem that, that took place with our great general circulation mm. magazine. Here is another argument being made, or talk to me about the magazines that we now see. Dateline at your own network. I just saw a listing of the top 20 shows. It was in the top 20 last week for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe it's a good program. Maybe it's always there. 2020. Primetime Live, Day One, 60 Minutes. What does it say about network news that these programs the only little are primetime successes? The only dim idea I have about that, Charlie, <laughs> is that maybe the minute and a half spot is obsolete. With, a, with the evening news programs, with a 22-minute news hole, with the Today Show and Good Morning America having a short newscast, the stories that, that appear have to be a minute or a minute and a half, 60 mm -hmm. seconds or 90. I wonder if we have not reached the end of the utility of that kind of journalism and that American viewers are asking for something a little longer, please. Yeah. And also I think the Perot phenomenon showed us that people would like to have their own voices in there. They would like to ask the questions or have their peers ask the questions. Mm -hmm. You know, reporters ask procedural questions. When are you going to deliver on the health care plan, mm -hmm. Mr. President? Citizens say, is that health care plan going to be good for me? Yes. It's a world it's a of difference. versus a incremental question. Sure. You know? I mean, the qualitative question is, how does it affect my life? The incremental question is, what's new that I can report on that's a headline for tomorrow? That's right. You know? So that I think journalism is changing. I'm not sure it's for the worse. Listening to the programs as we did last year, the, I thought a lot of the people calling in, a lot of the people on the White House lawn, asked really useful questions in terms of the political dialogue that we were having but last year. But weren't those questions being asked in a lot of the programming that you saw, even on the evening news, some very basic questions about what is this candidate's policy on health care and on a whole series of issues, whether it be education reform or welfare reform or crime. I saw a lot of coverage in the newspapers, in the New York Times and other papers, as well as the television shows, asking those questions. Journalists work very hard to present that in understandable right. form. I think, though, that voters and ordinary Americans really like it when they hear one of their own mm -hmm. asking a question like that, and they probably understand the answer a little better. And I thought that the, the, we'll still have to go over the record of 1992 presidential politics. I wonder if there wasn't more communication than there had been in previous elections. You believe it was or was not? I wonder. I'm not sure, well, but, but what, it may be true. But so you, you're more likely to believe that there was more communication in 92. There was more opening my up. Look at MTV, the yeah. president appearing there, the candidates appearing on MTV. MTV has all these newscasts that right. I didn't know about all day long. <laughs> uh, they have something called Rock the News. That's what they did. And uh, who am I to, to sneer at a thing like that? They reached a lot of young people, and a lot more young people voted. So there's something going on out there that we have yet to understand. Yeah. Back to the news magazines. Uh, do you think there are too many? Do you uh, approve of the nature of what the subject matter that they deal with, which seems to be a lot of it having to do with investigative things uh, and crime and, and, and those sort of issues that are hot issues? Well, I think a lot of it, and this applies to some television, is, is might be... Well, I'm talking about television news magazines. Yeah, like well, well, but also okay. the news magazines do right. this, too. A lot of it is sort of, look, Ma, I'm different. Right. I'm not like those others. 
And so that what you do is you get stories that are not quite as global as they used to be. You get a lot of investigative stories that show the torment of some really unimportant official. Uh, Mike Wallace has been doing this for years. People don't tune in 60 minutes to see to, because they're interested in the hapless official who is a miscreant. They're interested in seeing him skewered by Mike Wallace. It's Commedia dell'arte. Yes. And, and I think there's much more of that in journalism. I sometimes, Charlie, I think that what we, I really liked it when I began because there was a kind of a big river of journalism that went down the middle of the country. It was the Associated Press. It was the large newspapers. It was the networks. Uh, and we all pretty much agreed on what the important news was. Uh, exploring space, solving the problems of civil rights, uh, fighting the Cold War. These were ob objectives that seem to me to have kind of gone away now because of history. But there was an agreed upon idea of what the news was. And that's why I call it the Big River. I think now we're fractionated. We've gone into a million different parts of the news. And what you're going to get because of more cable are dedicated newscasts to particular kinds of people. Okay, But you, Walter Cronkite uh, is now at the Discovery Channel doing a whole series of things for them. If NBC had, when you walked in and said, well, my time has come and I'm going to say goodbye to being a commentator for the uh, NBC Nightly News, and the president of NBC News, uh, Mr. Lack, had said to you, then what do you want to do, Jack? Is there anything that we have here that is a proper vessel for your talent? What would you say? Well, they did or can say. can I create something? They did say, would you like to stay on for a right. while? And I said, no, I don't think so, because I think 43 years is enough at anything. And I do think the culture of the news has changed a lot, and I would rather write about it and perform in it on television in different ways than I had before. Twelve years or eleven years of being a commentator is, uh, is a lot of commentary, yeah. and, and I'm just about ready to start a new career at age 66. Doing what? Well, books, for one right. thing. I have two books that right. I have to finish. Memoirs? No, not exactly. One might have a little uh, flavor of memoir in it, yeah. but it's a book about television and politics. And, and what will you say, and what's the sort of... Some of the things that, that we've, we've been, been saying about. here yeah. tonight, about what it was like then and what it's like now, and whatever ideas that I can draw from that comparison. When, you're, when you told your parents that you wanted to be... <laughs> <laughs> that, that it was not being a doctor and a lawyer or a candlestick maker, but that what you wanted to be was a reporter. I broke their little hearts. I know you did. <laughs> well, my father said, you know, it's your life, yeah. uh, but you're, you're condemning yourself to a life of poverty, and you're going to want to get married and raise children, <laughs> and you're going to have to do that in poverty. My mother, I think, thought it was very close to organized crime. <laughs> Because journalists were the what? Well, reporters. I mean, this was Chicago. I was going in the newspaper business. Right. And, they hung uh, out with low life. Ho hanging out with low and life. Policemen and policemen people who, who, and did, who, who, who traveled in terms of the conflicts in life. Well, that's right, because there, there are very few definitions of news, but the one that I've cobbled together over the years yeah. is that news is a chronicle of conflict yeah. and change. Yes. People have to know about conflict in their own society or in their own world. They have to know about change if they're going to adapt to it. Those are the two things that journalism does really well. And that is, I will stand on that. My parents never really understood it, but they did understand. I think my father really understood one, one terrible truth about journalism. And that is, he thought I was getting into it because it was going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> And he was right, Absolutely and it right. was many years before I found that there was also a kind of usefulness to it. It was a glorious way to begin a career. Define the usefulness of it. Oh, I think when you do carry messages of change and of conflict to people who read newspapers or magazines or watch television, uh, when you can describe the agonies of a country going through the civil rights of a revolution that we went through in the 50s, uh, when, you can, when you can show them the face of the Soviet Union, which was a pretty menacing country for many, many years during the Cold War, I think that has a lot of social utility. You can go home at the end of the day and think, you know, I did some good today. And the wonderful thing about journalism is that you probably had some fun doing it. What would you have done if you had not been a journalist? 
Well, my father wanted me to be a lawyer. My mother wanted me to go into the hotel business. I suppose if I ran a hotel for lawyers, <laughs> I don't know. I was, I was picked from the very beginning. I had a sense of vocation when I was in my early teens. When were your happiest moments at NBC? I remember Chancellor and Van Oker and Frank McGee, and, and many people said that was four. Who, was, who else was there? Ed Newman. Ed Newman. The you four know, horsemen. The four horsemen you were called. Yeah. Uh, that there had never been a team or field that, that was any better than you well, four. Well, we really owned the political conventions there for a few years. Uh, we, without, the competition was very good. There, many of those people are, have been around for years and are still around. But what somehow NBC, with Reuben Frank helping a great deal, was able to put together a team that was synergistic. We helped each other. We all worked, and the story came out in a kind of crystalline, Reuben Frank would have said Mozartian way. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun to work there then. That was, those were days of, of when you didn't even know how powerful you were. In 1964, I came off a convention floor one night and one of the NBC executives said it was a 71. And I said, what's a 71? And he said, it's share. I didn't know what share was, but it was our share of the audience. That made you feel. 71% of the people watching television at that time were watching, were watching us. Roll tape, 1964 Republican convention. You can't talk about John Chancellor without taking a look at this. Here it is. Well, I'd come in if I could, David, but I wonder that I may be under arrest. The, uh, they have been trying to clear the aisles here, and it's an understandable problem at a place like the Cow Palace, with all the people on the floor. And we were waiting to do an interview in the Alaska delegation, and two of the sergeant's arms came along and said, you'll have to clear the aisle. And we said we were working, and they said that didn't make any difference to them. So I sat down, whereupon a policeman, badge number 21 from the Daly City Police, there are now two policemen here, uh, and came and tried to eject me forcibly, I think is what they'll say on the blotter. And according to instructions from my editors, uh, I am not being ejected, but there are two here now, and I suppose if they're prepared to carry me, uh, that's the situation. If you'd hold on for a second, I'll ask and see. Am I going to be carried out? Yes. I beg your pardon? You'll be removed by orders of the sergeant at arms. Fine, I wonder if I could get your name. My name is Gary Kidwell. Okay, uh, I don't want to debate this with you, Mr. Kidwell. Well, let's get on with it. All right, I believe I'm acting under instructions now from the National Broadcasting Company. I'm about to be removed. Go ahead, gentlemen, remove. Any similarities between that convention and the one you saw in Houston? No, really not, because those, that, that convention... That was the 1964 Republican I Convention. With Barry Goldwater was the nominee. It was really the start of the modern world. Many of the delegates had not been at a convention before. That was a big change. Because Goldwater had swept at a grassroots movement, That's the Republican right. Party. And he had elected delegates around the country at state conventions. And, and, the, uh, and the delegates didn't know much about politics. Mm. They, they were, it was a conservative, highly conservative group. I was standing underneath the podium when Eisenhower, the former president then, addressed the convention and used a line of, in his speech about self-serving columnists and commentators. And there was this feral roar from the cow palace. Several thousand people were just screaming with rage against the press. And I looked up at Ike, and he was going like that. He had no idea of the power of that, yeah. that line with that convention. So it was a very serious convention. Um, the Wall Street Republicans walked out, led by Nelson Rockefeller of the New York delegation and Jacob Javits. They walked out of the convention. Their it was a glorious yeah. story. No, no, their candidate was Bill Scranton. But I remember a process where they were trying to get, Walter Thayer and other people were trying to get General Eisenhower to define the Republican nominee so that Barry Goldwater would not fit that definition. Right, but, no. but by the time they got to San Francisco, it was Goldwater's well, convention. Well, it was a powerhouse. And also, Goldwater had a, a certain uh, a measure of his own independent popularity that was separate from his ideology. He was a genuinely nice man. Yeah. The press loved him. 
our colleague Robin McNeil, Robert McNeil, yes. was the NBC correspondent with him that year. And all of us would, would like to go with the Goldwater campaign because he was such a kind of beguiling, so candid and frank and candid interested and open and, candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Fascinating where he's coming. He's the guy who is now out there talking about gays in the military That's right. and taking at, at odds with Clinton and the decision being made by the president. I think he will go down as a, as a great senator. Um, there was a, an act about control of the military called Goldwater Nichols that right. he and a congressman put together that has transformed the American military and I'm afraid journalism failed us on that one because not one voter in a thousand knows about Goldwater Nichols. Uh, what does it say? It, le it sets up, it, we, we fought the Gulf War on right. the basis of Goldwater Nichols. It set up a single line of command so that you didn't have to fool with all the different services. You had a single commander and it came from the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Powell, right. down to General Schwarzkopf, who was the boss. Right. And we hadn't fought wars like that before, and we fought this one very capably. All right, let me, let me talk a little bit about the people in this business before we see some other stuff. Um, Chet Huntley, tell me about him. Mount Rushmore, man of great courage. Uh, he was a liberal radio commentator in California um, at a time during the McCarthy days when it was very difficult to be a liberal radio commentator in California. It may be even today difficult. Uh, he was courageous. Certainly in Southern California. In Southern California. He was courageous. He was a fascinating guy. He was a lovable man. <coughs> we all thought that he was hired because he sounded like Ed Murrow, who was then a very big star. Uh, it turned out that he sounded like Chet Huntley, and he lasted for years and years. And David Brinkley. Well, an, an old, close friend of mine, uh, one of the funniest men I have ever known, uh, one of the most clever writers I have ever seen. Um, a, uh, you know, if you share anchoring at conventions, yes. uh, you really get inside each other's heads. I, I blush to think that Brinkley knows what goes on in my mind and I know <laughs> what goes on in his. Uh, they, there's, there are a lot of funny things in that mind and in mine, I know. But I, couldn't, I can't think of a better partner. More irritating and frustrating and at times and more interesting to be with and more genuinely intellectual. How so? He, because he, he, he's more interested in ideas and well, reads not and, only and does he read them. and thinks about ideas but he can he states ideas very well he thinks in terms of ideas and, and has concepts. a sense of the culture and a sense of its history and also he can see and this is something that I hope I had a little bit of I know Brinkley had a lot of it he could see an idea a development a story beginning to grow right in front of your eyes at a thing like a political convention and could begin to identify it early on and so you could nurture that story as you saw it developing. Uh, did you see Cronkite coming on when he was uh, going to eventually take over? Walter was pretty much on by the time that, that um, we got into competition with Walter. Uh, he, was, uh, he was already, he began anchoring, as I recall, along about the time that Huntley and Brinkley began anchoring. But I was they, in they were far at away time. leading him. Uh, they the were far thing. ahead right. of him, and Walter's great days came when they when when Huntley left right. to and go to Montana to go to Montana, and when I took over and shared it with Brinkley for a year, and then did it by myself, and those were Walter's great years. Uh, but we always thought of Walter Cronkite as a kind of a of a presence in broadcasting, and I think he is he's a he's a gifted broadcaster in the sense of of perhaps old-fashioned broadcasters. He, he believes in the use of the voice. He believes in the timber of the voice. So did Huntley, incidentally. Yeah. Brinkley, I think, just talked. And the rest of us since then are just talkers. Yeah, after Brinkley. There, it seems to be now that you don't have to have that Huntley thing. I mean, no one does, in fact, who's there now. No, but it came out of radio with people like Bockage and, and, some, and some of the older uh, radio analysts and newscasters who were very theatrical when you listen to those old records now today. They, they, believed in, they believed in the news, but there was a kind of a little show business theatricality to it. Even the famous Irving uh, uh, Kaltenborn, Hans Kaltenborn, 
was H.V. Uh, Colton H. V. Coltonborn was that Truman way. used to mock him. You remember that great line? Well, that was because uh, they. That was because Coltonborn in the '48 election on the NBC radio network <laughs> kept saying, "We have to wait for the farm vote. We have to wait for the farm vote. When the farm vote comes in, Harry Truman will have lost." You see, it was one of those old <laughs> yes, things. That's right. And. <laughs> and, and, of course, Harry Truman didn't lose that election and, and made fun of Colton Bourne endlessly after 48. Any, any choices that you wish you had made that you did not make? Did you come to any forks in the road and it was the road not taken that you think about? Oh, I think I've had a really blessed career. The only kind of fork in the road, I suppose, was when I did the Today Show. I was the host of the Today you know. Show pretty much against my will. The, the, that was part of the growth of television. The Today Show with Dave Garraway had been an enterprise of NBC entertainment. Uh, the news division took it over when I was assigned to it. And you refused to do commercials? And, and all. I refused to do commercials with support from the news division. Uh, but I found that, that it, there, was a, there was a degree of, st of stagecraft in that that was just beyond me in the early mornings. It was much more of an entertainment program. <laughs> yes. Than, than it is now. Now it's quite a good yeah. news program. And Brokaw then came along, though. And Brokaw came along, and, but and I, I think I, by getting out of the Today Show, yeah. I didn't get into that business about show business. I went back to Europe. I became a correspondent. But do you again. regret that at all, or do you? No, no I you, celebrate. You, okay, you, that's you're the, happy you that made was that the choice. One really smart decision that I made in my life, and it was one of the few that I had to make. Most of these other things have happened to me. But I did ask to be relieved of the Today Show job. And they very gracefully, NBC News, got me out of it. It took a long time. And one of the pieces of advice that I was given when I announced to my boss at NBC News that I couldn't stand this one more minute, he said, you can't get off right away because people will say you were a failure. And we've got to see that you don't look like a failure. Mm -hmm. So you hang in there, and we'll arrange for you to get off. And it took another six or eight months. And they preserved my reputation. And then you went off to Europe. And I went back to work. Yeah, reporting. Sure. Yeah. Is being a foreign correspondent, um, was that all that it, you had expected it to be? It was more. More of a struggle to get on the air, though. Well, in those days, because there were no jet planes and there were no satellites, and film had to be developed. Um, it was more of a gentleman's game. I mean, you, you really, it, you took, you worked three or four days on a story, and then you sent it by slow prop plane back to New York where it was edited and put on mm -hmm. the air. It was much more like magazine journalism in those days before it was taken over. But being a foreign correspondent is, I, I like to say that it is all the wildest dreams that young kids have when they go to the movies on Saturday afternoon mm -hmm. coming true. I was, I was in the Algerian desert with the French Foreign Legion, and I made a movie in the Khyber Pass for NBC. And I did all of those wonderful cinematic yeah. things that correspondents get and to do. And so do you think today, when you sit home to write this book at your word processor, or these books, you're going to be fulfilled and happy and turned on as much as you have been by what you have been doing? I will be turned on because it's a new challenge, and it's kind of a summation of, of things that I want to say and, and get on record. I know, Charlie, when I'm going to have a terrible uh, pang of, of, of homesickness for daily journalism. When? When the plane hits the skyscraper, when the earthquake oh. hits the big town, when something bad happens to the president. Do, does your leaving the commentating role mean that we will not see again? There's no more, obviously, the late Eric Severide on CBS and you there. Bill Moyers did it for a while. Is that over? Well, it isn't over on public television. It isn't over on McNeil Lehrer. They sure. have commentary. Uh, it isn't over on national public radio. They have commentary. I'm not advertising for jobs. They, uh, <laughs> and, and it isn't, and on some of the Sunday programs, there is commentary still. Brinkley still does a little tiny commentary at the, at end, the of end of it. But that's a kind of a whimsical thing. It is, and it's, and it's, it's sort of jovial yeah. and easygoing. But uh, I think if, if, if a broadcaster develops with a background a little bit like mine, 
I think you might see a commentator at one of the networks again. With the same kind of background. You see, I think it's an organic... And what is that background? Well, I think it's... I think one thing is the, the trust of the viewers. I had been anchoring for about 12 years before I became a commentator. They knew me. They had, they had the audience. spent all that time with me, and that's a dozen years, and that's a long time mm -hmm. to get to know a broadcaster and a journalist, and I think to some degree they trusted me. Yeah. That made it much easier to begin doing the commentary. It's, you know, it's amazing doing a show like this every night with the many guests like you and, and writers and authors and a lot of serious subjects and talking about science and medicine and health and politics. Your own enthusiasms are reflected there and your curiosity and what happens is the audience gets to know you and they let you do because they trust you whatever it is you want to do I mean, you can go and, and go a long direction in terms of the spectrum of your interest I think the spectrum is that's a good word for it but I think that you still have to be a disciplined broadcaster you have to pay attention to what you're doing and you have to follow the rules I think you do I don't think you can do this business just in total free form. No, no, I don't either. But I'm, my point is that the uh, connection with an audience, that, that an audience, the, the bond that an audience has, and if they know you and they know what you are about, if they see enough of you, and they, uh, that's a very special connection. The best letters that I have had over the years are people who say very gently they think that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that they still like me, and yeah. we're still in connection but they think I was just a damn jackass on yeah. one particular subject or, or not, but they're still there. And that kind of communication yeah. is very rare in journalism, and I think we in television have it to a degree that almost no one else has, because they see your face and they see your emotions, and you cannot just be a cold fish and do this kind of work. Because you will not connect and they will not, you know. How to see you? How does John Chancellor see America today, and are you optimistic for us? I ought. I think there ought to be a. Because um, my. Go ahead. I think that there. That, that I think people ought not to be asked if they're optimistic beyond age six. <laughs> <laughs> what's right and wrong about America in 1993? I don't know what's right and wrong. I know what's puzzling. What's puzzling? What's puzzling? You're going to help me find the right question, aren't you? Well, what's puzzling <laughs> is the. <coughs> To me, and some people have instant answers to this, uh, what's puzzling is that we have gone from, in the 40 years that I've been doing this kind of work for NBC, we've gone from looking upward and outward to looking downward and inward. From we, an unlimited frontier well, to limits. Yes, well, well from questions of, of a global role, patriotism, of, uh, of containing communism, of going to the moon, of extraordinary noble expeditions in space, to a, to a really ennobling uh, agenda on civil rights that seemed to characterize the first few decades, or first two decades at least, of my work at NBC. What we've done now is we've gone to look into ourselves for wellness and for diets, and we're sort of looking at our innards more than we, we did before. It's gone from the head and the heart down here somewhere. And That's your complaint about television. No, it's my complaint about newspapers, magazines, and the general uh, culture. Or about media. And about did movies. I mean, I just think that... The, that we have, we have turned inward as a country. The things that concern us are individual, personal me things. Tom Wolfe wrote about the me generation. Yeah, yeah, me I wonder if it's not really coming true now, that we are all concerned about our own well-being. We're concerned about our own interpersonal relations. The world out there doesn't seem to exist are, are, the way and, it used and to. And less a sense of community? Yes, and less, I'm afraid that the country has grown, Charlie. I was stunned when I looked this up. From 1950, when I joined NBC, to 1990, the United States population grew by 100 million people. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think we have less connection with one another than we did then when everybody used to take the kids to the movies down on Main yeah. Street. You know what's amazing to me? I can go back to my North Carolina farm and on a Friday night, you can stop at little filling stations, service stations, and little country stores, and people are gathered around talking. They're not at home sitting in front of the television watching it. And you still see some of that. And I find that in the country, in rural areas, a very nice thing. I think it is, and I think television is witlessly 
I mean, it's just the technology of right. Nobody thought this up. No human thought it up. Right. The technology of television tends to divide us because people go to the video store and buy two or three videos, and a family goes home, and they watch in separate rooms. They don't rooms. talk to each other, exactly. And, uh, and I find that, that I wrote a commentary recently on this. Some offices, some companies that hire salesmen now are taking their offices away because they can communicate by fax, by computer, by many other ways, and so therefore there goes the water cooler, there goes the feeling yeah. of yeah. solidarity that workers have. The union membership in this country has gone down. Unions were great for wages, but they were also the best lonely hearts clubs in the United States. Women got married to other yeah. union members. All of these things are, are pulling us, it seems to me, apart, and I think that's dangerous in our society. And what about leadership in America? How is it serving us? I, I, I read that you don't think a whole lot of some of the presidents. That I don't think a lot of Between but, but, Kennedy and Well, Reagan. after Kennedy, I think, they, they, I think that a lot of them were, to use an ordinary word, turkeys. That's the word you used. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we've, the United States, the people of the United States since the death of Kennedy have seen one failed presidency after another. Uh, Ronald Reagan was supposed to have been a wonderful, successful president. Two terms, the only one since Eisenhower. Uh, his poll ratings are now a little lower than Jimmy Carter, who left under a cloud. So I think we're into something that I'm be thinking of calling the postmodern presidency. A country that can't generate enough jobs, that can't build up its, its economy, economic growth fast enough, so that presidents just get gobbled up after four years. Yeah. And I worry about Clinton, not because he's Clinton or a Democrat, but because it is a good thing to have a president in there for a couple of terms. Mm. Great to have you here. Come back when you finish those books or any other time. Thank you, you Charlie. Can be a commentator on this program good anytime. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. John Chancellor, off to write books and uh, do what a lot of us ought to do more of. He's repotting and um, seeking a change and, and looking at new frontiers. We'll be back. Stay with us. Form a top street gang on the sidewalks of New York. TNT tames the urban jungle tonight.